What happened? Eh? Right, Good, everyone. <laughs> wait, wait, man. Wonderful Hi. morning to everyone. Good morning to you, Jeremy. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. I just finished my morning exercise, and right. uh, we are uh, we are on a different time slot today. That's what's nice about being uh, on uh, uh, social media, right, Jeremy? Exactly. Being online, you don't have any time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, why do you think we are going live morning today? Oh, because we will be interviewing someone from the other part of the world. And uh, okay. we're really excited uh, for our guest today. I, I, I'm excited too, no? And, uh, you know, uh, you you were from, you stayed in the U.S. for how many years, Jeremy? For like 10 uh, years? What, more, yeah, I, I guess so. Cause, cause, uh, my early years, I spent uh -huh. my early years in uh, Los Angeles. In California, and then oh, also wonderful. my uh, adult year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you studied there, right? Yes. Uh, All right. Inter, inter and, <laughs> and, All right. Wonderful. And also um, college and master. All right. No, but but you're not. You are not our guest. <laughs> yeah, I am not. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah. We, we really have someone from the U.S. right now. Uh, let me just give a brief background about him, uh, about our guest. Um, he was originally from Nairobi, Kenya. He was born there. He, was, uh, he, was, uh, he stayed there, and now he is in the U.S. He, uh, he has a degree in political science and recently finished his master's uh, education. Listen to this. This is wonderful. Um, he finished curriculum development and technology. So today, uh, the, uh, the topic is on uh, communication for teachers, and we're going to relate whatever we will learn today about communication to technology, uh, especially remote learning. Our guest is also very active in his church. Uh, without further ado, let's bring in our guest tonight, Mr. Nelson Masinde. Good evening, Nelson in the U.S. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I guess good morning to you. Yes, one <laughs> yeah. Yes, wonderful. And and people are greeting already, yeah? Like this one. She, Mar Marjorie <laughs> says good morning, huh? Good morning. Uh, Eileen, yes. A lot of people are viewing and uh, they're already saying uh, good morning. Wonderful. Nice to see everyone up. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, this time. We're normally we normally show this at 9 p.m., but uh, right now because of the time difference, we are uh, doing it at uh, at uh, what do you call this nine in the morning and it's wonderful and i like to see a lot of and i'd love to see people here That's so awesome. yeah how are you nelson i'm doing well i'm doing well i had a busy oh. day doing running virtual seminars and uh still going getting ready for tomorrow as well so it's been it's been exciting all right wonderful uh, if you haven't shared this yet uh do share now and uh, start the watch party yes jeremy you wanted to say something Oh no! Um, I was just saying, what do they get when they share the video? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah! We send you a one hundred percent gift card from Kaihusai. Yes, one hundred peso. <laughs> yeah, one hundred peso. peso gift certificate. Yes, and uh, and by the way, by the way, if uh, if you have any questions for Nelson, uh, he'd be happy to answer all your questions. Okay. 
So exactly. yeah, Nelson, aside from those things you mentioned, any other things you're busy with right now? Well, right now I'm working, I'm doing uh, seminars for a company here called Skill Path, and uh, the, we went virtual. We used to travel all over the country, and now we're doing them virtually. So we've had to condense them. What used to be a whole day, we had to do it in three hours now. And oh. now we're running them uh, online and still meeting with people all over the country. Today I did a social media marketing seminar. So that was, that's, that was, uh, that's exciting. And uh, that's been taking up most of my time. And then in the evenings, I teach for a fully 100% online school. And I teach, so students send me the assignments and I grade them at night and send them feedback. And then the next day they send the assignments again. So it keeps me very, very busy. Wow, you, are, you, are you more busy now uh, during this quarantine? It's amazing that, yeah, I'm, more, I'm busier now than I was when I was uh, traveling. And, and then... <laughs> The only, di only difference is that I'm home, so now I'm even busier because I have uh, the wife and kids here too, so so it makes it yeah. uh, very exciting. And you don't have to ride the airplane anymore. You just uh, click in your Zoom and you're there in another place, like you're here now. That's the best part. I, fi I finished <laughs> parking and I go downstairs. <laughs> no, no, no more riding airplanes. Yeah, so no airplanes, anyway, yeah. yeah. So um, what, what brought you into this um, career? I'm just giving well, some I, bit of a background, yeah. Right, yeah, I started off, I finished uh, my undergrad in political science, and the choice was either go into politics or go to law school, and I didn't like either of those choices at that point. So I was volunteering at my church at the time and working with some of the young people, and so they asked me to come and help out. They didn't have any male teachers, so they asked me to come and help out with some of the young boys. And I jumped in right away and I started uh, helping. And before I knew it, I had a full-time job. So oh, I started well. teaching. And eight years later, I decided to leave because we had our first child and I was jumping into corporate training. Oh, so okay. corporate training got me first into communication. I was training people on effective communication skills. A three-day course where we took the sales people and all the people who speak for their companies through a effective communication boot camp, so to speak. And then a few years down the road, I've, I ran into Skillpath. And uh, at Skillpath, I started realizing the value of uh, communicating online and creating that online space. And around the same time, I was starting my master's program, which was fully online. So it kind of all coincided and worked well together. And I realized how big and wide open space this is for me to be able to train and coach and teach people all over the world using online methods. And that's when the light bulb went on. Because okay. initially I was still thinking the classroom, but you know I switched to online, and I haven't looked back since. Yeah, great, great. So, so with uh, with with your eight years experience in uh, teaching uh, in your church, what what was the subject uh, you taught there? I was a social studies teacher, so I taught uh, I taught Bible, I taught geography, history. Yeah, it's, it's strange that I was teaching American history. To, to American uh -huh. kids, and I was from a different country. But they, oh. <laughs> half, the time, half the time, they say, we don't, we're not sure if we should believe you. But I was like, <laughs> I'm getting it from the book, so it's, it's correct. But anyway, yeah, I taught history, all the histories, world history, American history. But my favorite was American government, because I'd just come out of school with uh, political science. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So, um, was was there any realization? Oh well, you, you realize that there's really a big need for, um, uh, for for online learning, right? So, right. but that came ahead. Right. Of uh, of this pandemic, right? So. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Way before before the pandemic. Uh huh. And, so, and, and tell. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I I thought I was gonna go back to school because I, I was still debating should I go to law school. Or, or what do I do with my degree? And this took me about six years. And I finally decided, okay, I'm gonna go back and do something that will benefit me in the career I'm already in. And when I got back to uh, the, the university, I just took master's in education, just general, high education. Okay. And halfway through I realized I might be wasting my time if I don't specialize in something important. So then I started researching and looking through some of these things. I ran into some of this uh, Khan Academy and some of the stuff we're studying in the master's program. And I realized this is the way of the future because if somebody can pick up a cell phone in a remote village in Africa and learn something, then we need to be able to fill that space with the information they need. 
And you know, being from Africa, I realized people have smartphones and some of them have no electricity. But now they can have access to education, even though they don't have electricity in those villages. And that education will uplift them so they can develop the village. So all that kind of, the light bulb went on and I began to see all these dots connected, how the whole world can really benefit from educational resources wherever they are. They don't have to travel to the United States. They don't have to go to Europe. They don't have to go anywhere. But where they are with the smart can access these technological tools and get educated. Wonderful. I, I think we are aligned on that vision that uh, <clears throat> remote learning is going to be global and uh, it can really help uplift lives of uh, people. Right? Yeah. And uh, what we're doing right now is really connecting everyone, uh, the teachers from the provinces here, from within the city, people watching you right now. So, you know, we're really trying to connect education using technology and it's wonderful. And that is the the subject or, or your thesis, right? Or, or the main uh, subject of your master's degree, right? Right, right. So it was uh, uh, curriculum design and using technology specifically. So right. if I'm going to design any curriculum, how do I add the technological element to make it both remote and it can be done in class, but it can also be done remotely. Okay, so so let's talk about let's talk about uh, your your main topic today, which is communication uh, for teachers. So right. um, yeah, what 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 idea would you like to share our teachers, uh, most especially that they are transitioning from traditional to uh, digital? Yeah, so my my concern has been always with teachers. When I left teaching, I realized if a teacher does not communicate the concepts clearly to the students, then the students walk away either confused or they have to go find other sources. And those other sources may not be the, the right ones to find the information from. So I, I was compelled to develop a program that allows teachers to understand how to communicate effectively. And if you can have that basic foundation of knowing how to communicate your message effectively, then you can apply it to any subjects you're teaching. It doesn't matter if you're teaching math or sciences or, or social studies, you take the same concept and apply it and you communicate effectively to get your point across. But now with the online and, and uh, remote learning, it goes, it gets even more complicated because now you're, you're communicating to students who are distracted because they're sitting at home and they may be distracted with all kinds of things. And then it takes away your ability to be more animated using your body language. And all they can see at best is your face and then they can hear your voice. And so you have to really make sure that your voice is carrying the message accurately and correctly. And then your body language is not taken away from what they're, they're hearing. So, so it makes communication that much more important that the other person can't see you you know, at least full body uh, communication. All right, uh, Nelson, so yeah. what communication skills are needed by teachers, let's say if you are conducting synchronous or asynchronous classes, let's say? Okay, so you need, uh, mainly it's your voice. Your voice is gonna be the main thing that carries. And then if, the, if people are able to see, see you, then you can use your facial expressions as well. To, to communicate the message. What you're still missing, I mean, as a teacher, I was, I was always animated and most teachers are because they understand the use of, you know, you gotta use your hands and you, you, have, yeah, you have to express yourself. Yeah, but when you're sitting here in this little box, it's very difficult to animate everything. And so right. you have to use their voice and their facial expressions. And then you have to use all the tools you have at your disposal. If you have a whiteboard, you have visuals like videos and things like that you have to get very visual for people to really get the message. Yeah, so so let's start with uh, uh, what you mentioned uh, and probably, uh, well, which is very important right now, the voice. Let's start with the voice. Any, mm -hmm. any tips for those watching right now on how to make sure that they can clearly uh, deliver or based on their objective, make sure that uh, students stay and, 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 and watch? Right. Yeah, so one thing I learned about the voice is actually I learned from listening to radio. I, I, I've listened to radio all my life. I mean, growing up, we had, we had radio and it'd be one of the main things we listened to. But I never thought about the radio presenter. And so I started thinking about the presenter on the radio. The, the presenter doesn't know if I'm there or not. You know, I could have gotten up and left, 
and they may be talking to nobody or they may be talking to a million people. But when you listen to a radio presenter, they don't change their tone of voice. They do the same right. thing every single day, exact same way they do it, because they know there may be a million people on the other side or there may be one person and there may be nobody, but it doesn't matter. So when you're doing remote learning and you're trying to get people to connect, you have to do the same thing all the time without the assumption that maybe now we have uh, 100 people or maybe we have two people. If you do it the same way all the time, your voice will carry, the tone of voice will carry, the emphasis you put on certain words will be significant and you'll be able to get your point across and get people to understand what you mean. So, so what you're saying is like, be like a DJ on a radio. Exactly. And so, if you listen to them and start <laughs> emulating what they do, it, it gives you a lot of effective reach. <clears throat> Wonderful. We have one point already from uh, Nelson. <laughs> so be like a DJ on the radio. Yeah. And that means being able uh, <clears throat> to uh, uh, keep that, uh, to maintain that tone of voice. Exactly. Okay. So, so the mindset should be like, um, people are still listening. So I have to be animated. Yep. I, I mean, at least my voice should be um, animated or, or not monotonous. Exactly. It should have. It should play, right, Jeremy? And yeah. and uh, exactly. So your voice should be like 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 playing like like waves, right? I mean, you know, right. it shouldn't be in in one tone. Yeah, okay. no monotones. So, yeah, no mono so um, um, Nelson, when it comes yeah. to handling a student versus a group of students, does it really matter? Uh, uh, what communication style works best when it comes to? dealing with one student versus maybe a group of students? Yeah, the only difference is what, when I've done these seminars virtually, sometimes I've only had one person. When mm -hmm. it's one person, I slow down a lot more and make sure they understand each point and we can move on. They, they end up getting more, essentially. But if it's several people, and I know there's several people on the call, I move a little bit faster and I kind of leave it to them to, to ask questions. So if you know how many people are there, then you you want to you want to get yourself uh, to spread yourself out to them, all of them. But if you don't know how many people are there, then that's when you go back to the DJ thing because you just just do the same thing and hope that they, they get it. Uh, one single student, I would slow down. I'd, I'd have a conversation with them and uh -huh. go back and forth. Let's say you're dealing with a group of ten students. Should you ask them individually? Like, should you go one by one? Like, hey, do you understand uh, the subject or what I'm what I'm saying? Uh, no, ten ten will be too many. You know, I okay. guess if it's uh, like we're teaching a whole semester class, then maybe you can stop and do that. Mm -hmm. but some of the classes we teach are three hours long, and all I do in the beginning is I just have everybody introduce themselves so they can hear everybody's voice, and then at the end throughout i mean I'm, I'm asking them things but one of the things i try to make sure i do is throughout the course of the learning especially remote learning i give them activities to do to make sure that they're still there they're still engaged so there are things that require everybody to do and i want to get an answer from everybody and i'll sit there and wait until we we get all the answers and then there are things i just have two or three people contribute and we we'll move on okay. and but going through 10 people, asking them, each of them, it, it's, it wastes a lot of time. Okay. All right. So, one, so wonderful. I learned something new. So we have to give um, activities, right? Activities are great. I love them. Polling questions, you know, asking people to re respond to something like, what, do you, what, what would you do in this situation? Asking them to talk about themselves is, is always big. Most people don't realize that. Everybody loves to talk about themselves. So when you just throw out a question and say, tell me about this, about yourself and your work, and people just talk and talk and talk, and you have to not stop them. So, <laughs> what, what, sort of, what sort of activities you find effective for, for, for a class? For an online class? Yes. Uh, people like uh, polls. Polling questions are great, mm -hmm. where you can set up a question with uh, multiple choice. And, and then, or you can set up an open-ended question and have them share what their knowledge is. Uh, people like their ability to, to research. If you give them a, a break, say, say, let's break for two minutes, go 
uh, look for look this up and bring us the answers. I love those activities. And after you teach a concept, having them practice it. So sometimes I'll go silent and I'll say, let's practice this. I'll give you five minutes and five minutes I'll come back and see what you have. And you'll be amazed at the things people come up, come up with. And it just creates a sense of, even if it's online, it's a sense of community. You're still working together and collaborating. Okay. I don't do a lot of games online, but some people do. I haven't figured out how to make it work very well yet. Great, wonderful. So, so um, wh wh when you're teaching um, uh, a class, are there any things that you need around you that you can, you know, pick up easily? Um, like, for example, yep. like water, anything that should be around you. Yep, I always have my water. <laughs> a bottle of water or a glass of water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my lips get dry and I have to pause and drink some water. I always have a snack. That's me. I always have okay. a snack. Great. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I have to put it here. I'll always have something beside you, right? I mean. Yeah, always have. That, that's me. Some people don't, but I have a snack because if I get really hungry, I want to keep the momentum going and I can't get up. And then yeah. I, I'll have books, the books that I'm trying to teach on, and I'll have some notes, you know, next to me. So that's those are four things, I guess. <laughs> what <laughs> snacks do you usually snack on? But well, right now I'm doing Starbucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it right. changes every time. Whatever I feel like. How about you know to get chips? You, like, I'm uh -huh. not like eating meal. <laughs> how about you, Jeremy? Do you have anything beside you right now? Uh, I I have a, a sandwich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so no matter where you are, okay, you always need to have something beside you, like something to. Uh, something to munch or something to drink, okay? Because, yeah. you know, recently I experienced um, having dry mouth because of uh, talking a lot over Zoom. And I, I, I feel like you have to speak loud, especially that you don't see yeah. uh, 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 the, the person in front of you. Do, do you. do you do that also? Do you do you, do you find yourself speaking louder than normal? Yeah, yeah. Because you feel like you're speaking to a, a dark hole, so... You know, it's like there's yeah. nobody there. <laughs> and most yeah. people on Zoom, they, they, because they're at home, they don't want to turn on the video. So so you see their name there and you see they're there, but <laughs> you can't see them. So <laughs> you find yourself leaning in and talking a little bit louder. And that's where it goes back to that whole uh, radio DJ thing, trying to maintain the same tone. And it's not, it doesn't come off as too much or too little. And you kind of mm -hmm. maintain the stability. And if they can't hear you, they'll tell you. And if, if uh, you know, they'll probably say, I can't, I can't hear you, that was too soft. But if you're too loud, they may not be able to tell you, but just kind of watch yourself <laughs> if you're okay. not too loud. Uh, by the way, what platform do you use for online? I use Zoom. I use Zoom for, for if I'm teaching live classes. But for course creation, the courses I'm creating, I'm using Thinkific. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's how I met Nelson uh, yeah. through Thinkific. We are Thinkific users. That's where we right. uh, put our uh, webinars. I, I hope Nelson uh, would later put his uh, uh, website, uh, sorry, his videos over uh, our Thinkific page in Kaibusai. So we can, uh, so the teachers watching here right now can actually uh, buy it and uh, see Nelson's yeah. uh, experience and wisdom uh, through his videos. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely uh, walk through that and, and get you started. Yeah. So, have you have you done already videos on communication uh, webinars i've done Not asynchronous i mean i uh, i've done i haven't done communication lately i've been doing a lot of uh, so, uh, social media marketing digital marketing and copywriting those are the ones i've been working on and uh the only thing i've recorded that's short videos just short promotional videos okay great wonderful and are they all in thinkific now or not yet? No, no, I think if we can only have one, I have one course that's uh, called Speak Right. That's, uh, that's more of uh, teaching you the communication skills. So it has like oh. 31 different lessons where you go through how to communicate effectively. So that's my oh. main big, big course. Let's, let's talk about Speak Right. Uh, right. What, what is it? What's the objective? Where can people see it and buy it? What, what, what is it? 
Yeah, so, so I have a link uh, which uh, I, I can forward to you. It's, it's uh, Houston's Thinkific right now. But the uh -huh. objective of Speakrite came out of uh, me beginning to understand that if, if you don't learn how to write well, then it's hard for you to speak well. So most okay. uh, speakers, especially speakers who are, are used to speaking all the time, and especially teachers, because we're always talking. We right. just get up and talk, get up and talk. But I learned the, the art of writing. I'm also a writer, and I write well. And I realized that when, when I write well, I speak better. So I started yeah. connecting the two. When I write good script, I can speak better. And I've never liked uh, reading from a script or reading a speech or okay. feeling like I'm in front of students and I'm reading off a piece of paper. So I'm always uh, one who used to do bullet points. I used to write the bullet points so I don't miss anything. And the reality was anytime I wrote something down, I'd end up speaking on the things I wrote down and not anything else. Mm -hmm. So it keeps you concise and it also keeps you on the topic rather than just going in and starting to talk because you know the material so well. So I developed speak right and kind of put the two words together and, and being able to speak correctly, speak right. But then the right is actually writing. So you, uh, you, you now learn how to write well so you can speak better. And it takes you through different lessons that show you how to write well fast, thinking through your thoughts, setting up the scenario, knowing where you're going, what your end goal is, and adding your visuals and everything else that you want to say, and then eventually speaking. And it also talks about recording yourself. Yeah. Can, right. can you share? Can you share some? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jeremy. Oh no, no. Uh, I was just asking, uh, Nelson. So speaking of um, speak right. Right. Uh, so when I'm, let's say, teaching and I'm communicating with my students, should I use my words or their words to foster understanding? Well, you use your words in, in their language, so to speak. So okay. you, the best you can come up with is, is your own. I mean, they want to hear the authentic you, but then you have mm -hmm. to incorporate things that they understand. So figuring out what are, what are the things that they relate to so like when i came when i came to the united states and i was teaching here i was teaching american students and a lot of my analogies and examples were mostly kenyans so i had to start learning what things applied to them but they wanted me to remain kenyan because they loved that whole experience they didn't want me to become them so i i, I would talk about kenyan experience and relate it to the american experience and then they kind of get a holistic view of uh, what i was referring to can, can you share some 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 tips uh, to those who are watching right now? Uh, those tips from your Speak Right um, webinar, uh, any pointers uh, that can help our teachers communicate better in the new normal, especially right now okay. that they they won't see their students physically. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I talk about in Speak Right is is thinking about what's natural, what comes natural for you. And, and a lot of times we don't know. We don't, we've never sat down and thought about, am I a natural speaker or am I a natural writer? And what comes natural for you needs to be turned into uh, the, your strongest weapon so that you can make sure that you're using that to your advantage. And then I also talk about what's not natural. Let's say, I say speaking is not natural. You know, talking is natural. You, you're born and if you're normal, healthy, you, 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 you talk. But speaking is communicating so that the other person understands. And it's not communication, it's not effective communication until the other person understands. So it doesn't matter how well I said it, it doesn't matter how long I said it or how many times, until the listener understands, it's not effective communication. And so basing everything we do on the other person and if they're getting our message. So it's, those are some of the different concepts I walked walk them through and then bring them to a place of saying, am I being effective and how do I know? So there's certain body cues when people are nodding, they're telling you that, yeah, we're understanding. When you get some good feedback, you're telling you that you're understanding. When a student repeats to you what you said and you feel like, wow, they got it, that's, that's understanding. But if we're just talking and people are not getting it, then we're not effectively communicating. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 So what was your uh, journey yeah. like? Oh, yeah. Jeremy. Go, go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, so, what was your journey like in developing this speak right? I mean, when did you start? Uh, how did you go through the whole process of developing this? Uh, uh, should I call it framework or, or, or pointers? Yeah, yeah it, it's been a long journey. I've, I've been speaking since I was nine years old. 
and <laughs> I've taken all those experiences and kind of rubbed them into everything. <laughs> so that's about, uh, just to date myself, that's about over 30 years ago. Uh, when I was uh, nine years old, I got up in front of people and spoke, and I used to do memorize scripts. So I'd talk for three minutes, and I'd win the competition and go all the way to the nationals and be the best speaker oh. in, the, in the in the city or in the county. <laughs> yeah, so so that was my experience starting out. Then I did some plays and learned different ways of speaking. Where you, if you've memorized something, one of my biggest frustrations was if you forget just one line, it throws you off. Yeah. And so I reached a certain point. I said, I, 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 I don't like memorizing. I don't like memorizing a whole script because it, it messes me up when I forget. Even if I finish smoothly, I'll beat myself up because I missed that one line. And so I started developing a different way of speaking without having to memorize a script. And this may have started maybe at my years after high school when I was doing plays and acting and things like that. And uh, fast forward to when I was teaching, that's when I really started developing the bullet point method. Meaning you know everything you wanna say, but you can put it in six or seven bullet points and say, these are the six things I want to cover. And by the time I'm done, I'll know how, what to say about this one bullet point and what to say about this. Even if it's stories you wanna say, put them in bullet points and say, I'm gonna talk about this story here. I wanna use this reference here. I'm gonna talk about this book here. And when you're done, you're done, don't say any more. So my journey took me from the memorization to I started to talking too long because then I had too much to say. Yeah. <laughs> and now I had to start bringing it down to the middle to say, I'm gonna limit myself to five or six things I wanna say and I'm done. And when I'm done, even if it's good and I wanna say any more, I'm, I'm gonna stop myself and move on to the next thing. So it's so a lot of me, me, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, Jeremy needs that. <laughs> yeah, I don't stop. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> and it's because you're thinking and you're thinking and talking at the same time, and your mind is telling you this is something good. Say this. Say this. <laughs> exactly. And the next one, yeah, you 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 need a lot of self discipline to yep. really uh, to really stay within those points, right? Right. Uh, do, do you really have to stick to six? I mean, I, I know others who say they they only do three. I mean, yeah, well, yeah. In fact, the program I teach on uh, effective communication, the boot camp, we designed it for three. We told them we told them do three points, but this is because we had mostly salespeople who can talk a long time. So, so <laughs> Jeremy, that's really for you. The gift they can talk. So it's like. And then we had engineers on the other side. Engineers can get into analytics and analyze things. Oh, yeah. So we limited them to three points. That's that's all you get to say. But there's freedom in that. You can do three points, which is ideal for people to remember. But if uh -huh. you have if you have a story, you can add that as your fourth. If you had an analogy, you can add that as fifth. And if you have maybe a reference to something, that can be your sixth. But the top three things you want to cover, that's a method that a lot of people use that's very effective as well. Oh, all right. Well, I, you know, uh, six or seven, you, you can, you know, but but it's just putting them in bullet bill, bill points and knowing that when I'm done, I'm uh -huh. done, not saying anything else. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, let your voice rest for a bit. We'll just read some messages and then go back to your pointers again, all right? All right. So uh, people are watching from um, Ilocos, that's uh, north of Manila. Uh, good morning to you, Sita. Uh, those people, a lot of people are saying good morning. Uh, Leia Sampaga, good morning. Uh, May Joy from Mountain Province. Wow, Jeremy, all the way uh, yeah. there in Mountain Province, all the way north. Wow. Uh, good morning. Yes, good morning. Oh, a lot of good mornings here, huh? And yeah. uh, let's uh, hear from Department of Education in Cavite. All right. And good morning there all the way. Yeah, Batanga, south of Manila. Uh, here is uh, like 45 minutes uh, from Manila, Bulacan. Yes, good morning. Uh, Laguna, yes, good morning. Oh, a lot of people are uh, saying good morning and hello to Nelson. Uh, <laughs> if you have questions for Nelson, uh, just type it here. Okay, if you have your comments, okay, if you want to ask him something, just uh, type it here. Good morning. So, uh, yeah, last one from 
uh, Ilocos Norte, oh wow, uh, and La Union. These are people from North and South. All right, North and South wow. of Manila. All right, so going back, Nelson, to your um, to your pointers. Okay, so uh, I, I, I'm intrigued by uh, the first point you said when you said natural, okay? Right. So you have to first know what, what most people are natural speakers, of course, right? They, they speak mm -hmm. before they write, okay? Right. So, but then you said you have to be able to write to be able to speak better or is it you know uh can you speak better and then you know write better how, how does it work well it depends it depends on your, your how you're cultured some people are good speakers and, uh, mm -hmm. and are not good writers so 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 if you're a good speaker but you're not a good writer then maybe you get somebody to help you with the writing part and and uh, help you to put your thoughts down and make sure that you're 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 organized a lot of people I've, I've met who are good speakers and not good writers they tend to be good at saying one thing if they they get on one point and they emphasize that one point they're very good but the moment they have to expound on something and teach a long concept they get lost mm -hmm. or they or they end up talking very long and not getting to the point but if you learn how to write those thoughts down first and then practice them review them look at them again and then you begin to speak, your speaking will be much better, almost 10 times better once you've learned how to discipline yourself and sit down and write the thoughts down. And it doesn't mean you have to follow them step by step. You may get up and feel like I need to change things around, but now you have the freedom to do that because you have a framework to work within. Now, if you're a good writer and not a good speaker, it works as well because now you can write things down, but now we have to work on the speaking skills, which is a whole nother a whole nother uh, class and all another lesson to, to go through. So. Okay. Uh, speaking of communication, again, for, for teachers, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to parent-teacher communication, uh, right. do you have any tips for, for the teachers out there, uh, especially when it comes to conveying the welfare of the students to them? Yeah, the only thing I can say to teachers is be positive. Okay. <laughs> for a teacher, <laughs> having been a teacher myself and knowing what teachers go through on a daily basis, it can be tough to be positive the moment you get to the parent. Because a lot of times when you're talking to the parents, is because the student has done something wrong. And so if you're positive, you learn how to say the positive thing. It's called the sandwich method. You say something positive, and then you sandwich the negative thing in the middle, and then you end on something positive. And, and if you... Method. Yeah, if you, yeah. If you learn to do that, you'll notice the parents will be more open to your feedback. Because if you're coming off with negative feedback all the time, then they start fighting back. Because nobody's child is bad. No matter what the teacher thinks, nobody's child is bad. They're all great kids. All right. <laughs> so, so learning to be positive and just sandwiching things in the positive, negative, positive, right. and you, you communicate better. That's uh, one of Jeremy's favorite uh, framework as well, the, the sandwich. Awesome. Yeah. No, I just love the sandwich, not the framework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so um, getting aside, the reason why I asked is because the Philippines, well, our country is transitioning from face-to-face uh, -face classes to online classes. Right. And one of the concerns of the parents here in in our country is the children may not be getting the, the education that they need, especially if it's uh, through online methods. So right. how do you uh, give them good feedback and how do you uh, calm them when it comes to uh, uh, assuring that the students would still learn a lot and uh, it would still be a good replacement to face-to-face uh, -face classes. Right. So, so we've had to deal with that with uh, my own kids as well. Just with everything being shut down, we had to come home. And we had to start figuring out, are they getting the education they need? Because everything is now is, is gone digital. I think the parents have to be a little more involved. We have to encourage them to be more involved, make it easy for them to onboard. So I had to I had to train some of the parents. I was a parent myself, but I was helping them with uh, get the apps you need, 
load them on your phone, make it easy for your kids to submit their homework, to find their homework, make the transition as easy as possible on the parent side. But then at the same time, the teachers have to make it easier for the kids to interact and to engage in the learning. The teacher has to realize that when you're doing online, you can't do as much as you can do in a live setting. So if it's a one hour lesson that you do in a live setting, you may only be able to get through half of it because of the distractions that are there. You may have to say things a little bit more and you may have to give kids a little more time to to interact and engage. So so you have to deal with the reality that you can't do as much as you do in a classroom setting. But at the same time, you still have to get them what's most important and help the kids learn and make sure that they're learning by getting feedback from them. So you talk a lot more, you get them to interact a lot more, you call on them to answer questions, you have them do activities, write things down, all kinds of stuff while they're learning. Okay. Great. All right. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding your program, um, let's go to uh, the things you ran before. Okay. How right. how the how did Speak Right or the other communication programs help your clients? Uh, I mean. Yeah, were there feedback? Uh, yeah, yeah, I get a lot of a lot of great feedback. So I do it not just with my clients that I that pay, paying clients. I've also done it with people that I've mentored. So being part of the church, I worked with some of the young kids in the school. But I was also a youth pastor around the same time, and then I ended up starting a, a, a guy's house. So it's a bunch of guys, me and a bunch of other guys were all single at the time. So we decided to live together. But then I decided to, once I moved out, we felt like the house needed to continue. So now we have another whole other group of young people living in there. But some of the guys I've mentored in that house, I helped them with communication skills. So I was, I was uh, saying, if you're going to lead the house, I used to work with the person that leads the house and help them communicate. If you get feedback that, oh, they, he talks a long time, but I don't, we don't know what he's saying, we don't fully get it. So I yeah. start working with them on that. You need to uh, sharpen your communication, get to the point quicker, tell them what you mean and move on, and then tell them how to ask questions so that people can communicate back to them, give them feedback. And so I, so I did a lot of that, but then professionally, and, and I, I see those people developing, but professionally the feedback we get is that it, it sharpens their communication and one of the clients was saying up to 10 times better. So I have- oh, Great. Yeah, up to 10 times better after taking the class. And I have my like my golden student who, who went through this course. Uh, he works for a company called RSA here in, in uh, Boston. And uh, he was already a voice student. He was learning how to use his voice and do voice commercials and things like that. And so he had a great voice. So I used him in the class. I used him to make introductions and do all these wonderful uh, voice impressions of people. So we had a lot of fun. But as, as soon as he finished the class, he went on to audition for his company, and they used him. They use him now as the voice of the company in their commercials, and wow. and he keeps, he keeps writing back to me saying how thankful he was and how grateful he was that he took the class and helped him understand how to use his voice effectively. So he's like my golden child. Uh, <laughs> I claim that I helped him <laughs> get to where he is now. Great. So, Jeremy, I'm intrigued by that program. Maybe uh, we should enroll too in that Nelson's program. Exactly. <laughs> we should. We should, yeah. Yeah. We, we, Jeremy has a dream of being a radio announcer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, we have to be in that program. Uh, All dreams are valid. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, Nelson, about the books you've read before. All those books uh, that helped you uh, in developing your communication style. Uh, maybe you can share some of the books or authors uh, that influenced uh, you in uh, what you're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest ones, I actually have it here with me, is a book called Made to Stick. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Have you heard of that? I have, yeah, I've seen it in Amazon. I haven't bought it yet. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a great book. If you wanna, you know, it says why some ideas survive and others die, made to stick, and it talks about how do you make an idea stick. And this taught me. I read this maybe eight or seven years ago, and it taught me how to repeat something until it sticks. 
And when I was learning it, a lot of people were giving me the feedback, would say, why do you keep saying the same thing over and over? <laughs> but I was practicing my own skill. You know, I've gotten a little bit better with it, but the more you say something, the more it sticks. One of the things in the book is the seven factor phrase. You have to say something at least seven times for people to remember it. And, okay. and if you say it uh, three times, which is traditionally what we're taught, they don't, they don't remember it as much. But if you say it seven times, the more, the more the chances of them remembering it is much higher. So that book really influenced me in terms of repetition. So people will say, you say that so many times, and I'm like, well, you remember it, don't you? Because I say it so many times and <laughs> it's stuck. So if you're talking for 30 minutes and you repeat one thing seven times, people will walk away with that one thing. And that one thing can be like a thread. It unravels everything else they need to remember. And usually what I do is I'll pick that one thing as my topic. So I'll say, say I'm teaching on social media marketing and I want to teach on Facebook. I'll mention Facebook at least seven times in five minutes. So when they walk away, they remember he was teaching about Facebook marketing. And that will never, they'll never forget that. Oh, so that's, that's one book that really impacted me. The other one, you might, you might laugh about this one. The, the, the title is Why Business People Speak Like Idiots. Okay, that's new. <laughs> I haven't seen that. I'll, yeah. I'll write it down, huh? Yeah, this is uh, Why Business People Speak Like Idiots. I even, the three people that wrote it. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian Fugger, Chelsea Hathaway, and, and John Wachowski. And uh, this one basically was talking about business people are sometimes the worst speakers, the worst communicators, because they expect the consumer to know why they need their product instead of coming to tell them this is why you need the product and this is what it's going to do for you. And, and that, that really impacted me a lot. And the third one is the art of public speaking. This is oh, classic. Yeah, yeah this, this, I have that. This is excellent. And uh, just great speeches of all time Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, you know, some of those, they analyze all those speeches. So, those three books maybe have been the biggest influences on my life, aside from watching speakers and analyzing what they do well and what they don't do so well. So. Oh, okay. So, how do you analyze a speaker when you watch them? Let's say, um, I, I want to analyze a speaker, I want to speak like that speaker. So, how do you do it? Uh, you break down the mechanics. First of all, you look at what, what, what is their style. So style is important because you can't, you can copy a style, but you can't really replicate it. Style is unique to an individual. So, for example, if I use Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy, historical speakers, yeah. two great speakers with totally different styles. So I start listening to what's, what's their tone. Like I, I can almost get like a rhythm in my mind. Martin Luther King had the southern drawl, so he had a slow, rhythmic tone. John F. Kennedy was northern, and he spoke a little bit faster, so he had more like a bang, 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 bang. And so that's the first thing I analyzed. And then I started listening to their examples that they use. How, how do they speak? What makes them impactful? Are they telling stories? Are they using quotes? Are they adding humor to it? What is the style that causes them to really stand out? And once you figure out those two things, then it really gives you the basics for why that speaker is really good. And then you can start looking at the words, the choice of words. You know, the words are really not as important, even though they are important, but that's secondary. Tone so is words. there a more effective speaking style? Say, say it again. Is, is there a more effective uh, speaking style or? No, it's not, your, style is, your style is your style. If it's, uh, I think, people like uh, Martin Luther King, because he spoke slow, a lot of people thought his speaking would not be effective, but he was one of the most effective speakers. And then John F. Kennedy spoke fast. Most people prefer that. But Martin Luther King had that rhythm that allowed him to capture people's attention. And then he used all these analogies and told stories. And he never knew where he was going until he got there and he got people excited. So, so his style worked for him, but most people, if they speak slow, it becomes mon monotonous and boring. So, so, yeah. So, will this be effective in the digital classroom? I guess my question is, um, um, if a teacher speaks like a public speaker or a political mm -hmm. speaker, can this be applied in the digital classroom or even the physical classroom? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think it's even more important now because now you don't have the advantage of uh, of animating yourself. You don't have the advantage of going to sit next to a student and helping them out. You don't have the advantage of one-on-one -on -one conversations when everybody's left the room. You don't have the advantage of them seeing you face to face and you seeing them. So now you have to be even more animated. You have to use more visuals. You have to find other things to create the excitement and the energy. You know, it, it starts from the way you greet the students when they come in into the classroom, and, and then it carries on to what animations, what videos, what uh, uh, visuals you use. And then, of course, your voice is carrying the day, maintaining that momentum throughout the, the class. OK, I see. So great. So for those watching and listening right now, I hope you uh, learned many things from Nelson. He has a lot of nuggets and wisdom. So uh, is there a specific problem? This is my last question, but maybe Jerry we has some more questions for you. So right. um, is there a specific framework uh, that you can share to our teachers right now, to everyone who's going to watch this uh, in the future as well. Is there a specific framework uh, that you can share with them that will make them uh, more impactful, uh, make them uh, more effective as teachers in the remote learning area? Okay. Yeah, so the main framework, we have the whole concept of your the, the, the division between your, your tone of voice and your words. And uh, because you're teaching remotely and if people can't see you then your words will really cover a uh, 10 percent of what you say they carry 10 percent and then your tone of voice is going to be very important it's going to be about 90 percent and you'll hear this phrase said it's not what you said it's how you said it so the tone carries the day and you have to make sure you vary things in a way that uh, is effective so learn how to how to hear your voice well, I record myself sometimes and listen to myself because I know that's what people are hearing. And then I work on the tone voice, tone of voice and how to bring it up and down. And if they can see your face, then your facial expressions will add to that. You need to smile when you need to smile, you need to frown, you need to show up sun and use your, your facial expressions as well to express the emotion and the feeling. But you may have to be more animated, even if you're not an animated person. <laughs> Okay, I am great. For those listening, I hope you were able to catch those words. Jeremy, anything from you? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned earlier to be animated, right? Mm -hmm. What if it's not innate to me to become animated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's not innate, you, you want to think about the other person on the other side. How passionate are you about the things you're saying? And a lot of times when I coach people in person, I try to push them to the extreme. So one example was a lady who I was trying to, was trying to coach in the classroom and we coach her with other students watching. And uh, she, I was trying to tell her to say no, just the word no. And she was saying no, no. And I said, no, 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 no. You, I want you to say no emphatically, like you mean it. And she kept saying no, no. And I said, okay. You're, you're, you just got home and your kids have left a mess in the driveway. You can't park your car. And uh, they've spilled a bunch of stuff on the, on the lawn. They've toilet papered the trees. And you can see right through the door, the house is a mess. And you, your child comes, comes up to you and says, can I have some ice cream? How would you say no? <laughs> and it came out of her. And she was like, no! <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> So looking for those extreme situations where the emotion can come out and you have to get it out of yourself. And people can tell if you're not passionate about something. So you have to get that passion out and then you have to speak it with passion, whether it's math or science or geography. Just show them that you love it and they'll fall in love with it too. All right. So. Great. I, you, know, you know, I guess, Jeremy, my biggest takeaway from today is, um, well, technology is just secondary. What's important is the person, the teacher behind the technology. The, the way you deliver, the passion, the emotion should always be there. It doesn't mean that you are speaking to a camera. Behind the camera are, are, are your students. Right. Okay? But it takes more effort right now. Oh, yeah. Right? So, yep. so you have to practice and bring out the entertainer in you. I mean, yep. it's, it's, you know, you, so, so, so they have to stay, so they have to stick. You have to be able to entertain them. 
not just through technology, but through you know the tone of voice, the the facial expression, the gestures, everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. How about you, yep. Jeremy? Uh, well, for me, again, it's really important for you to connect, connect more to your students. And uh, one way to do this is to show how passionate you are, how enthusiastic mm -hmm. you are about what you're teaching, as well as giving them knowledge, sharing with them what you know. Right. So, uh, one last question, Nelson. Okay. Should, should I ask more? Or tell more. You should ask more. Ask more. Ask more. Yeah. You, you can ask, ask more, more. Jeremy. <laughs> 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 no, I mean ask more when it comes to my. Yeah, yeah. Instead yeah of you always ask more. Always ask more. That's. Uh, yeah. That's. I always. think that's the best. That's you ask. Gift. You ask them so that the their minds work. Uh, the gears turn when yep. you ask more. So yes. now students. Uh, surprised when I ask them questions because they think maybe I don't know and it's always you're <laughs> asking them because you want them to give you an answer and then you can uh, cover uh, give them the feedback and I always say one of the statements I, I give is you should never know what to say until you've asked the questions of the person you're speaking to so you know who you're speaking to and you know what their needs are and then now you know what you're supposed to say tell them yeah, so so those watching right now, make sure rather than telling them more or showing them more, start a discussion by asking them more, right? Yeah. So or give them a lot of activities that you can later on discuss. So I, I think um, connecting that, I think it's all about um, connecting with the students by asking them more, by trying to understand uh, them, the technology they have, the the capabilities, and uh, by asking them, I think. Uh, the the weakness and strengths of the lesson will surface, uh, right. right? So yeah, it, it's wonderful, Nelson. For uh, we we're really happy to have you here, and uh, maybe uh, uh, well, please invite them if you have a website uh, for uh, or or you have an email so they can get in touch with you. Yeah, so my website is uh, angazasolutions.com. Angaza How do you spell that? A N G A. Uh huh. Z A uh -huh. Solutions uh -huh. dot com dot com. Okay, and I'll put it in the chat box. Yeah, and my the first thing you'll find there is my my course, Speak Right, and you can go on and enroll and sign up. If we get a large group of teachers, there's a discounted price for for groups. Great. So yeah. yeah. Is that the one, right? It's on the screen. Yeah, that's the one. I'm that's the one. So I do, I do that. I do courses. I do seminars, and I also do, I also do social media marketing. So those are my three main things at the moment. Yeah. So if you need more uh, from Nelson, you can visit his website and Gaza Solutions. And also, I'm inviting Nelson. Maybe uh, we, Nelson and I, can talk after this one. Uh, maybe he has some webinars that he wants to post here in Kaihusai. Right. Um, so yeah, Nelson, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we learned a lot, and we had fun, and people yeah. are still <laughs> saying good morning, and uh, uh, someone from another island, Misamis Oriental, is saying wow. hi. Wow. Okay. And uh, and uh, where else? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Great. So yeah, um, I invite everyone to share this video. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, if you learned something, make sure your other teachers, uh, your, your colleagues learn something from Nelson too. So I invite you to share this video. I invite you to start a watch party. All right. So uh, Nelson, thank you very much for your time. Again, I'll send you a uh, message after this over Facebook. All, All right. right. Okay. Thank you, Great. Nelson. All right. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye, Nelson. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, Jeremy, that was uh, great, no? Yeah. Uh, that was a wonderful conversation with Nelson. I learned a lot today. I hope everyone learned too from Nelson. So I, I guess really my takeaway is uh, technology is secondary. What's important is the teacher behind it. And always watch the tone of voice. I think especially right now when, uh, uh, when some people don't have uh, uh, nice connections, stable connections or or, or the, the, the or they don't turn on the, the camera it's you have to speak like uh, uh, 
uh, a radio announcer. Okay. Can you so we have can, to learn that. Uh, can you give me a demo of your radio voice, Jeff? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I have to learn again. I have to learn again. But uh, anyway, we all had fun today. I hope you had fun, Jeremy. Yes, I did. So thank you, Jeff. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, yeah. All right. So bye bye. Bye, everyone. So see you again. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye.